I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our last, but certainly not least, speaker, Manuel Amieva, Professor of Pediatric Infectious Disease. Manuel is a national authority in H. pylori, in gastric organoid development, and his talks are always so interesting because of the beautiful images and the beautiful videos that he presents. Uh, and so we are so excited that Manuel actually was supposed to be at an infectious disease retreat uh, today, and he, uh, he actually left the retreat early to, to be with us. Um, so I'll hand it over to Manuel. Thanks a lot, Rob and Yuha. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, really nice for me to be back. And thank you for staying uh, after this is supposed to be over. I'm just going to start by saying that these meetings uh, are so important because uh, we actually started collaborating because of this meeting several years ago, and I think things are moving in the right direction. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff we've been doing with organoids because it's part of the collaboration we have here at Stanford now. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background, which you, if you were here last time, you probably already heard, but I can't help but doing that. Uh, so bear with me. So in, I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor. So what I care about is, you know, how do we prevent bacteria from causing disease? And what I'm really struck by is that now when I walk in the hospital, most of the disease is by bacteria that are colonizing us, like Staph aureus, for example. And this is also the case of H. pylori. So H. pylori lives peacefully in most of us, and then in some people it causes disease. But 99.999% of the time, these bacteria just want to live peacefully near our epithelial surfaces. I mean, nobody dies of H. pylori, you know, bloodstream infections. And none of those bacteria benefit from causing disease. So what I want to try to understand is how are these virulence factors involved in their colonization? And how is pathogenesis and how are pathogenesis and colonization related? In part, practically, we need to decolonize some of us from these bugs. But I also wanted to show you how beautiful this bug is. You know, it, it's, it's spiral, it swims with its flagella. If you slow down these movies, you can see that its body is twirling so it can burrow into the mucus of the stomach. It can turn without turning by just flipping its flagella and swimming like a helicopter instead of a boat. And if you think it likes acid because it lives in the stomach, you're wrong. We made this little contraption to inject little things into the solution. And you'll see on the right hand, on the left hand, right hand side on me, but left hand side on you, that the bacteria are leaving uh, right away if we inject a little bit of acid. And the other ones are mutants that can't sense. In fact, uh, I, I noticed that at Dr. Camargo, some of her risk factor genes were, were chemotaxis protein, so I can talk to her about that later. Uh, so when pylori arrives in the stomach, it's in the worst place it can be, a vat of hydrochloric acid that nobody really likes to live in, including H. pylori. So how does it survive? Well, first it has to get out of the lumen and find the protective mucus, and we know that because we find all the bacteria within, you know, a few cell lengths within the mucus layer of the stomach in biopsies, and those are presumably swimming against the current their whole life. So it's very, uh, you know, they, they waste a lot of energy because they're going down the drain anyway. However, some of them actually attach to the epithelium, and the ones that attach are the ones that really have been associated with disease when we know what the virulence factors are, because most of the virulence factors are really adhesins. They're the type 4 in, in, uh, secretion system. They're things that are delivered to the epithelium, uh, toxins like vaccase. So it's interaction with the host that causes disease, not necessarily the fact that H. pylori are even in the mucus. And they are very specific. They like to attach right over the the epithelial junctions, which is something that I was very intrigued by. So here's where I introduced the organoids. We, we, we wanted a, a system where we could use human tissues to look at these things. And uh, we were able to start culturing uh, gastroids, which are little epithelial balls of cells. The problem is that the lumen is inside. 
and they are inside a matrix. So how do we infect them was the first problem, and we were micro-injecting them, but uh, we were like, I was always telling my student, could you please turn them from apical in to apical out so that we can infect them? And in fact, we were able to do this uh, with a very simple procedure because we realized that the polarity of the epithelium is determined by its connection to the extracellular matrix. So by gently removing the organoids from the matrix and putting them in suspension, we got apical out polarity, which we can now use for infection. It was so simple that we couldn't patent it. But here's what happens. It's really cool if you make a movie you see that the, the organoids basically flip themselves inside out like a sock. And you can follow that same organoid and put it in the confocal microscope and see that indeed it's apical out. So we know that this is the mechanism that they flip around and now we have a system to infect them. This is just a time sequence by confocal microscopy. So I'm just gonna show you some advantages of this and we can make them out of many epithelia. One of the advantages is imaging, because this is a movie looking at a monolayer. You're trying to film bacteria swimming. They're always out of focus. Uh, so it's very difficult looking from the top. But if you have something where you can look from the side, look at the resolution here with this diagram, and then look at the resolution on the side view. Oops. Yeah, so you can see the bacteria drilling down and finding the epithelial junctions, and we can then stain these same organoids and see that, indeed, they found the epithelial junctions in these little pieces of tissue. We can also differentiate them, and they produce mucus, like the surface mucus, MUC5AC, and my student, uh, uh, Julie, had this other idea that she was gonna collect metabolites produced by these organoids and see if pylori could respond to them. And I thought that was crazy. I told her that won't work. And so she did it anyway. And you can see on the right-hand side that the bacteria immediately smell something that had come out of the organoid. So within a few seconds, they're swarming towards the needle. And it, this turned out to be urea. So they're sensing urea that is actually flowing in between cells. And that's one of the reasons they can find you. Then when they get to the epithelium, what do they do? Well, we made another movie of the, here's these two bacteria, and if you just watch them, what are they doing on the epithelium? They're actually colonizing it. And what I mean by colonizing it, they are living there, they're growing, they're dividing, they're forming a little group of little sister bacteria or daughter bacteria right at the junction where they landed. So they use the epithelium as a place to live. It's not just like uh, trying to destroy it. And they form these little colonies that are clonal. In fact, one, the, one of our, my first interactions with Rick Peak is we found that Kage had a, a, an important role here in the survival of these microcolonies. And one of the things they're getting from the epithelium is iron, so we, we found that pylori through Kage is getting iron out of the epithelial cells. The interesting thing came when we looked in vivo. This was a mouse model that we made, and we were looking for these colonies, and we found them on the surface of the cells, attached to the junctions. I thought that was great, we're done. But my students then looked in the full length of, of, of the tissues. This is a thick tissue uh, section, and you see the bacteria at the top with swimming in the mucus, but then if you look down into the, into the glands, you see other groups of bacteria way deeper in, in the glands, and you can reconstruct them so that it looks clearer, so they're, they're organized in certain places, and they even go all the way down to the bottom of the glands, and they're actually associating with the cells that are dividing, and also the stem cells. And in some other studies, we've shown that these bacteria are actually altering the stem cells. Oh, I think I actually added something. Oh, the two things we, that we, we wanted to know is, well, what, what, are these bacteria good for anything? What are they doing down there? Um, so we actually were able to make a mutant in chemotaxis that cannot, that, that can colonize at the same level as the wild type. But when we looked in the glands, 
They were only up in the mucus. They were not in the glands. So using this, this mutant, we've been able to ask, well, what are these gland bacteria good for? One of the things we found is that if we look for pathology, if we look for hyperplasia and inflammation, the gland mutant doesn't cost much. So not being able to get into this niche is important. So I'm just adding another risk factor to, to, to Rick's story is like location. So if the bacteria cannot go and interact with that region, there is little disease in an animal model. And why are the bacteria doing this? Is it beneficial to them? Well, if we put them separately, the, the, the mutant has no defect, but what if we mix them? If we mix them, the wild type wins 100%, no colonization by the mutant. And what if we give them sequentially, which is what if we first give one wild type and then another wild type, the second wild type actually can't colonize. And we know this from H. pylori that most people are colonized with, by one strain, and that strain, even if you get re-exposed, won't let somebody else come in. What if we start with a mutant that can't get into the glands? Then the wild type outcompetes it. And then if we look later at the stomachs, it's the wild type in both cases is, is the one that colonizes the glands. So this is all to say that both pathology and colonization are linked to this location. And that's not what we're trying to understand is, why are they interacting with these cells? So does this actually happen in humans? Well, we went back and looked at uh, 3D reconstructions of human uh, resections, and we found again these colonies down in the glands associated with mitotic cells. Um, as well as out down in the bottom of the glands where the stem cells reside. And there we actually find that they trigger stemness. So the stem cells start to produce more of the stem cell genes, which is some of the markers that, that Han Lee was talking about. Okay, I'm just gonna end real quick with this new model of the organoids that came out of this meeting. So we would like to create a library, not just of these tissues that are banked and dead, but live tissues that we can go back to. And so we had the idea, well, if you guys are doing biopsies, can we also try to immortalize them? And immortalize them by simply keeping the stem cells alive. But to do that, we actually had to be able to create organoids from single biopsies, which is not that easy, but Yulim came in my lab uh, who's there is, is, was able to do that. So she uh, used a lot of tricks to uh, dissociate single biopsies into glands. And lo and behold, here's an example of over nine days, she starts getting these little blebs that contain organoids made out of a single biopsy. And now we, uh, we, we wanted to know whether we could make them out of the different regions of the stomach that are being used to stage old game and also out of different stages of pathology. And at where we are now is we have at least 15 uh, different, different uh, now banked organoid lines that we can go back to and they come from different parts of the stomach and, and different uh, stages of pre-neoplasia. So now we have a lot of work to do. Some of the things that we can do is, for example, look at the differentiation potential of these things. So here we're starting with the, the, the cells that are undifferentiated. Ki67 is a marker for replication in green. And then interestingly, yellow is MUC6, which is the neck mucin. So these guys resemble the bottom of the glands or the proliferative region. If we differentiate these same organoids, they start to produce MUC5HC and they stop replicating. So they turn into the differentiated surface epithelium. So now we can compare within one organoid, how does H. pylori interact with different parts of this differentiation cascade? Last thing I'm gonna show you is some potential ways that we can infect them. So we can do very quick attachment assays and the bacteria actually go to the junctions. We can measure them, uh, the amounts, 
and then we can wait just for 24 hours and they start growing on the surface into these microcolonies and we can measure their size. So if we take two wild types that just differ by a, the, a color, they both attach the same and they grow the same. If we then mix them, so in a, in a, they're completely mixed and we allow them to attach, they will attach randomly but at the junctions in two colors. So what's gonna happen if we let them grow? Well, if we put them in conditions where they're getting their nutrients and they're getting stuff from the human, are they gonna stay the same? Are they gonna move? Are they gonna mix? They actually stay as clonal colonies. So that gives us another added level of resolution. We can then combine mutants with wild type and see what happens. So this is wild type versus wild type. They attach the same, they grow the same. This is a little colony of a, a mutant that cannot deliver Kage uh, in high resolution. And if we measure those, they're actually smaller. So within the same organoid, the bacteria are utilizing locally their virulence factors to grow on the epithelium. So now we're expanding these to looking at different stages of differentiation and trying to figure out what these virulence factors do for the bacteria, and also to do it in different stages of preneoplasia. So I'm gonna just stop. Oh, the last thing I was gonna say, because it links in with Hanley's talk, is uh, uh, Hanley is teaching you limb how to do single cell RNA-seq, and this is, of course, gonna be really powerful to tell us what each cell is feeling when H. pylori is colonizing it. But one technical thing was to be able to dissociate this without losing the bacteria. So Yulim was able to do this, so now she gets little single cells with their bacterial colonies attached to them. And we can then do the single cell sequencing. And we can actually distinguish, again, CAG-A by uh, 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 just the difference of having or not CAG-A uh, will give us a different signature in these organisms. So I'll just end there uh, because you guys have been here long enough. And uh, I don't know if we have time. We're going to do some questions.